Okay, good morning. We thank and praise God for this opportunity to be here on today. I respect to Pastor Marriage, Dr. Felker, and Sister Felker. We hope and pray that things are going well for you all on today, as well as to our trustee chair, Sister Gloria Williams, and Brother Eugene Williams. It was good to see you this past Sunday, and we hope that things are going well for you both on today as well. Uh, we want to continue to pray for, as well as acknowledge, our chairman, Milton Taylor, for he is in the hospital at this time. But we want to pray for our sister Repsy and that family as well and hope that things are going well for you guys on today as well. Uh, we also want to acknowledge those that are here with us uh, in person for our Bible study on today as well as those of you who have taken the time out to log in and the friends uh, and members of the Mount Carmel Missionary Baptist Church. We thank God for each and every one of you all who are taking this time out to share with us on today. Uh, we're looking forward to sharing session 22 today, the faith to anticipate, where we're actually talking about living a faithful life while anticipating the return of Christ. We're now in 2 uh, Thessalonians, and, uh, and we're going to wrap up that chapter today. There's a lot in there to bring us up to speed with as well, and so we're looking forward to that. And so we're going to start off with our opening passage of scripture, which is one of my favorites, the 51st Psalm, verses 1 through 13. Then we're going to have our opening prayer. And then we'll go right into the lesson. In the language of the King James Version, it sounds like this. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight that thou might be justified when thou speak, and be clear when thou judge. Verse 5. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Verse 9. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 13. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to see another day which we've never seen before. We ask that you would invoke your blessings upon us as we come together in this time of learning, this time of sharing, this time of expression. We ask that you be with those who are with us in person on today, as well as those who have taken the time out to log in and be with us. Then, oh God, we ask that you be with those who have a desire to be with us in person and could not as well as those who had a desire to log in with us today and could not. Continue to keep us all now. It is in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Okay, so now, uh, first things first I'd like to do, and uh, one of the things I want to do as we go through uh, today's lesson is to bring us back up to speed, which works in two ways. Uh, if you weren't with us in the last session, it brings you up to speed, but it also gives you continued clarity if we cover some things in the last session that might, uh, you might just need to hear again so that they can kind of hone in because these are very important parts that we're getting into now uh, because it's going to determine the difference between what the church in Thessalonica was dealing with and what we as Christians today are dealing with. And so it becomes important that we kind of reemphasize and re-engage engage those sorts of things. So now having said that, from our last lesson, we began with the discussion of righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. Uh, now, let's listen to verses 5, 6, and 7 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And this is the New American Standard Bible. I'm going to read it for you. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment, so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you indeed are suffering. After all, it is only right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted, along with us, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from 
through heaven with his mighty angels. Now, interestingly enough, he's talking about <clears throat> this term that we introduced last session called righteous judgment. And God's righteous judgment was at work among the Thessalonians, and it was purifying them as followers of Jesus by showing them worthy of the kingdom of God. Now, that becomes very, very important because he says that, and you say, well, how can a judgment show me worthy? And, that, and I think that was a thing that I really wanted to really kind of re-engage everybody with. Because usually when we think of judgment, we think of bad stuff happening. Okay? Or, or as you've heard me define on many occasions, we're getting what we deserve. Well, it becomes important because it still means that. But remember now, he, he said righteous judgment. And so that becomes important for us to look at. Because, you know, when we take a look at it, it becomes important for us to see that uh, there's always been the discussion of whether the saints will be judged by God. And if so, when, how, and more importantly, why? And I think you all remember I shared with you last, the last session how people have given us those images that uh, when Jesus returns, we're all going to stand before the great white throne and we're going to have this screen and we're going to see our lives and, and all this good stuff. And it becomes important for us to understand that that, as it is indicated and indicative in the scripture, is going to happen, but it's not, and I repeat, not, and I repeat one more time for the folk in the back, it is not going to happen for the people who have accepted Christ as their personal Savior. Think about this. I shared this last session. I want to share it now. Now, why would a person accept Christ as Lord and Savior, which means they saved? You all know it. If you believe in your heart the Lord Jesus, Confess with your mouth that God has raised from the dead. The Bible says you are saved. Okay, now, why would a person do that, become saved, and then live out their lives looking forward to the day when they will be raptured? They're either going to be the dead in Christ, which will rise first, as the scripture says, or we're going to be those who are left. We're going to depend on when Jesus comes. If Jesus comes right now, it's going to be those of us who are left. Because the dead in Christ is going to rise first. And if it's a hundred or a thousand years from now, we'll be gone and we'll be part of the dead who rise first. And whoever's here will be the those who are left. But now, having said all of that, all of that happens. You change, you translate it, you rapture it in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And then you're going to tell me after Jesus does that, then you're going to be judged according to your works. I mean, think about it now. It's important for us to understand that, okay? Uh, 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 nothing could be further from the truth than that, okay? Uh, if you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior, and when that time comes and you are raptured, that's it. You are as saved as you will ever be. Now, I'm not talking, you know, I'm talking about your salvation, and that becomes important for us to understand that, okay? So now... Since that's the case, it becomes important for us to think about the, that there must be, in fact, two things going on here. Share them last session, I'm going to share them again. The first thing is there must be the judgment of the unsaved, okay? And that's going to come after the time of tribulation mentioned in the book of Revelation, okay? Okay, that's the time it's going to happen. But then there must be something else that's happening. And that's the righteous judgment of the saved. Now, the righteous judgment of the saved, again, is not the same as the judgment that we know about, hear about, and are frightened of. Okay? It's the judgment that's mentioned here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Okay? And that becomes important for us to understand that. This, is, this reality is indicative of God's power protecting and strengthening us. Right now, as we live, navigate, and negotiate our lives, living, working, worshiping, and praising God in the midst of satanic opposition. Righteous judgment, brothers and sisters, is God preserving you in the midst of your struggles, enabling you to climb the mountain, enabling you to cross the valley, enabling you to make it through those difficulties. Yes, there's going to be scars from those difficulties. There's going to be tenuous and strenuous situations that will happen to us because of that opposition. But the fact that you get through it is what's going to be important. 
Okay, there was a couple that used to sing a song some years ago on climbing up the rough side of the mountain. And everybody really could identify with that. Everybody loved that song. I'm climbing up the rough side of the mountain, okay? Well, the, the reason why, the, the question that really needs to be asked is who's giving you the strength to climb that rough mountain? And that's where righteous judgment comes in. The righteous judgment of God is what God does to enable you to climb the mountain. The righteous judgment of God is what enables the saint of God to withstand the difficulties that we face from those who are against the church and against us for doing what we do for God. And so that becomes important for us to understand that. So now, this is not only the result of righteous judgment of the saved, but it's also a truth that needs to be shared and celebrated, brothers and sisters. I mean, we rejoice at the righteous judgment of God because we've accepted Christ as our personal Savior. Now, those individuals, and we'll get to that a little bit a little later, those individuals who have made a choice to not accept Christ as their personal Savior, made a choice to not want to worship God, made a choice to not want to do... They're going to face a judgment that is going to be nothing like what 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 sometimes people will try to get us to think that everybody's going to experience. Okay, theirs is going to be very very much uh, overwhelming, and we're going to get to that a little bit of that before we close today. Now, when we look at that, and then we look at the difficulties that we run into as Christians, because we do have difficulties. And it's been said that God is absent when we suffer and that the suffering and difficulties encountered by Christians cause God's righteous judgment in the question. Sometimes when you're going through, you say, well, this don't feel like no righteous judgment to me. This feels like the judgment everybody else is getting, okay? And then you have people that will tell you that. When you're going through situations and circumstances, and a friend of mine just mentioned that earlier when she was teaching uh, in another session uh, on another program, uh, today. Uh, she mentioned the fact of something that I've shared with you all on more than one occasion as well. And that, and that is the important for us to understand that, that, that people tend to, to, to think that uh, 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 they are easy to try to tell you what God is doing. And they don't even have a relationship with God. Sometimes there are people that don't have a relationship with God. They're quick to tell you what God told them to tell you. Now, how are you going to not be connected with God? You don't pray. You don't go to church. You don't accept Christ as your personal Savior. And then you're going to come to me and tell me what God told you to tell me. Okay? It becomes important for us to understand that. You get those voices that are out there. And it's important for us to understand that. And sometimes those are the voices that call God's righteous judgment into question. Instead of us realizing that our trials only come to make us strong, Instead of us realizing that we're climbing the mountain, that we're crossing the valley, that we're going through and we're making it farther than we ever thought that we could have or would have, and giving that credit to God and him strengthening us through that situation, there are those that will look at you and say, man, God trying to tell you something. All this stuff will be happening to you. Yes, sir. That's a great question, um, Brother Davis. How, how, can we, how can we judge it? How can we measure that? Okay, how can we make that determination? Now, it becomes important for us because, first of all, okay, the Scripture says that we should try the Spirit by the Spirit, okay? And what that means, instead of sounding all holy and holistic and stuff like that, it means that when someone brings you something like that, you take it to God before you act on it, especially if there's any question as it relates to the validity of such a thing happening. Now, that's one thing that you should always do. But then you should be mindful of this. If God is going, the, the question should be, why would God have someone tell me something that he could have told me? Okay? And, but there's a, there's, a re, there's a real possibility for that. Okay? And one of the possibilities is that God did tell you, and you didn't pay it any attention. And so when God has somebody bring it to you, the first thing you remember is that you heard it before. That's called confirmation, okay? And so you know that. But as far as just somebody walking up that you've never seen before in your life or somebody that you know that don't have a relationship with God and you know that, 
okay? And they tell you, well, you know, God told me to tell you this, okay? God told me to tell you that, okay? It becomes important for us to understand that uh, uh, we should be prayerful and go to God about it. And my, my thing is, if there's ever a doubt in your mind, go to the source, okay? Somebody come to you and say, Brother Davis, you know, the Lord told me to tell you this. You receive it, then you go to God. You say, now, the Lord, you know, Mr. Johnson told me this, okay? I mean, is that you? Or, or, you know, is that just them? Okay? Go to God about it. I mean, you can go to him about it. And you'll be surprised at the response when you do that. Okay? When you actually trust God and go to him, okay, he will respond. Okay? And it won't be nothing, it won't be a Ten Commandment moment that'll scare you. Okay? But, but God will give you peace and ease with it. Or he'll give you an uncomfortable time, an agitation that you know, eh, this might not be what you need to be hearing that, that this person is bringing you, okay? Because remember now, sometimes sometimes God, because he loves us, he will, and he has told us some stuff, and we ignored it. we like, ah, that ain't God. No, I don't want to do that. God will send somebody else to tell us the same thing. and then, but, but the only difference is you will know it because you know when God puts something on your heart first. Okay, so long answer to a short question. Okay, now continuing on, it becomes important for us to understand that the uh, the Holy Spirit takes Paul's teaching in the exact opposite direction of those who are trying to bring doubt about God's righteous judgment when he insists that the Thessalonians' suffering was evident of the righteous judgment of God, and it's evident of it because they're enduring it. They're surviving it, okay? That's when you know God is with you because you're making it through this stuff. It's tough, but you're making it through. That becomes important. Listen again to verses 5 and 7, 5, 6, and 7. He says, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you indeed are suffering. For after all, it is only right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. It becomes important for us to understand that where righteous or where suffering is coupled with endurance, that's God's work being done. Okay? Because when God wants to punish you, if God is punishing you, and if we're bringing stuff on ourselves, it breaks us all the way down. It doesn't make us strong enough to endure it. But man, when you are being attacked by Satan at every level, as well as physically or medically or mentally or spiritually or socially, and you still are standing and you don't know how you're standing, that's God's righteous judgment which you've given you the strength that you didn't know you had. Okay? This is why uh, we think about this when we say, we're saying, please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. When he gets through with me, I shall come forth as pure gold. Okay? Remember, to come forth as pure gold, you got to be heated. Okay? You got to be purified. You got you to have some stuff happen that makes you pure. Okay? That separates what, what doesn't need to be in you out of what is in you. Okay? So now, when we talk about this righteous judgment, it becomes also important for us to understand that it's also directed at those who persecuted the Thessalonians and manifested toward and is manifested toward them with tribulation according to their evil works. So God's righteous judgment not only gives us the strength that we need, which is important, but it also punishes his righteous judgment punishes our enemies. And remember, uh, our enemies are God's enemies when we are on God's side, okay? That becomes important for us to understand that, okay? God will strengthen us to endure the attacks uh, and will punish our attackers uh, with the deserved tribulation. And, and I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, that's good news. Amen. Okay? So now, let's listen again uh, to verses 8, 9, and 10 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Listen to this. This is what the day of judgment will be like for those who persecuted the Thessalonians and the current church as well. Okay, what well, I'm getting ready to read to you now. Verses 8, 9, and 10. Okay, this is what the day of judgment will be like for those who persecuted 
the Thessalonians and those in the church as well as those that persecute the current church as well. Check this out. In flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These people will pay the penalty of an eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified among his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Okay? So now the question is, when we look at a passage like this, the question again is, well, who are these persecutors? Okay? Now, these persecutors are those who do not know God. Now, when he talks about, when Scripture talks about those who do not know God, he's talking about those who will not change their hearts. Because we all come into this world not knowing God. Okay? But it's up to us to decide whether we decide to get to know him or we decide that I don't want to get to know him. I don't want to have nothing to do with him for whatever reason. And then those persecutors are also those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, as Paul said uh, in the passage. Well, what he means, those who refuse to change their positions. They hear the word of God, and they still don't want to accept it. Okay? It becomes important for us to understand. Those are the ones that are setting themselves up uh, for the judgment from God. But not only setting themselves up for the judgment from God, but those are the people that are also the ones that are attacking us for having faith in God, attacking us for praising God, attacking us for worshiping God. That becomes important for us to understand that. And so it also becomes important for us to understand that the persecutors, the persecutors of the church, uh, as well as uh, the church of Thessalonica, as well as the church of where you are, uh, they are going to be removed from the presence of the Lord. They will ultimately be removed from the presence of the Lord, okay? Uh, you know, we, we plainly put that is that the unsaved folk, they go to hell, right? The saved folk go to heaven, right? Okay. Well, one thing about it is that we don't think about a lot of times is that uh, we think about these two categories of people that are saved and are unsaved. But what we don't think about the fact is that those two groups of people exist in real time amongst each other. And there are so many times when you got unsaved people who are attacking those who know the Lord. There are people who know, don't, who refuse to know the God, and they will do all they can to demean you, to stop you, to keep you from worshiping God, from praising God in spirit and in truth, and will try to tell you all that they can because they're fighting uh, for their own egos and, uh, and their own average uh, ideas, rather, of, of not worshiping God or having nothing to do with God. And those people are unsaved. They refuse to accept Christ as a personal Savior. They don't want to believe in God. Some of them say, I don't believe in no God, no such thing as God. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in this church stuff. And I think one of the newest challenges that we have, and it becomes important, because this is a very subtle term, when people are starting to say, I don't want to have anything to do with organized religion. Okay? And, and when they say, I don't want to have anything to do with organized religion, that's cold for church. Okay, that's cold for, I don't want to have anything to do with church. Well, what do you mean? And so when they say organized religion, it's not in this lofty term that many times we think of. They're talking about a church that has devotions, that has Sunday school, that has choirs, that has nurses, that has ushers, that has youth departments. And, and what they're really saying is, instead of saying, I don't want to have anything to do with organized religion, what they're really saying is, I don't have anything to do with Christianity. But it doesn't sound like that because it just sounds like that they're having difficulty with the church as it exists, okay? Uh, organized religion. And it becomes important for us to understand that those individuals are going to face judgment from God, okay? It ain't going to be good, okay? And when it talks about them, uh, even in the scripture, it talks about them dealing with damnation or going to hell, as it were. It's important for us to understand that it isn't the fire. And I shared this with you all last time. It isn't the fire that makes hell what it is. Okay? We think about the fact that there's fire in hell and brimstone and all this stuff. But think about it. What truly characterizes hell is that souls are forever removed from the presence of the Lord. Okay? The sense of being apart from anything good or blessed in God's presence. Think about it. And I shared this with you guys last time. I'm going to share it with you again. 
The average atheist that walks around right now get a chance to feel this 70 degree temperature today. Get a chance to see the blue sky. Get a chance to see, to feel the air and the, and, and the, the wind and, and the things that are going on today. To see the beauty of this world. Okay, all the things that God has made. They get a chance to experience that and then have the audacity to walk around saying they don't believe in God. Okay? Well, there's going to come a time where those individuals who say that, should they not change their position, they're going to be removed from the presence of God completely, which means nothing that God has anything to do with, they're going to be around. It's going to be totally gone. Okay? And nothing, and, I, and that's true hell. That's hell when you have been removed from the very presence of the Lord. Now, nothing needs to be said more about his horrors other than hell will be completely devoid of God and every aspect of his character except his unrelenting holy justice to those who are there. His justice will be there because people give him what they deserve, right? Okay? So now, continuing on here, uh, it becomes important for us to understand that this is as much a truth of the present as it is a truth of the future. Okay? For the persecuted saints, those who believe, they have, they will have God glorified in them on that day. And they will see and admire Jesus more than ever. And that's not just when he comes back again, but that's every Sunday. That's every Wednesday. That's every prayer meeting. That's every Bible study. That's every time we, the saints of God come together. It becomes uh, it, and more important for us to understand that they will have God glorified in them because they're enduring the persecution of coming to church, of coming to Bible study, of coming to sing in the choir, of coming to teach in the Sunday school, of coming to learn in the Sunday school, okay? And, and, and this shows the difference between one destined for judgment and one destined for glory. And that's the future aspect of it. Okay, uh, the difference is the belief in the message when he says our testimony. The simple gospel of Jesus Christ is going to determine who's saved and who's not. Okay, you believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, confess with your mouth that God is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. How do you know about Jesus? Because I heard about the gospel message. What do you hear about? I heard he came down through 42 generations. I heard that Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead, gave sight to the blind. I heard that he fed the multitudes with a few fish and some barley rolls. I heard that he walked on the water. But then even more importantly, I heard that he died on the cross for my sin. And then I also heard that on the morning of the third day, which was the first day of the week, he rose from the dead and declared all power. But not only that, I heard that he declared before he ascended back to heaven that we shall, as he told his disciples, he continues to tell us, we shall be witnesses after the Holy Ghost has come upon us, and we shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, we'll be witnesses everywhere. Okay, we'll be doing our thing wherever we can. And it's all because of the gospel message that we chose to accept versus those who refuse that same gospel message, which Paul refers to as our testimony. Because when he talks about our testimony, he's talking about what I just said. Okay, and that should be our testimony. Everything that I said, okay, about what it is, okay? Now, interestingly enough, chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians closes with a prayer. And these two passages of Scripture, and I'll share them with you. Beginning at verse 11. To this end, also we pray for you always, that our God will consider you worthy of your calling, and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him in accordance with the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this becomes important. What a closing right here. Because since the Thessalonian Christians were in the midst of persecution and tribulation, they needed prayer. And here Paul assures them that he and his associates always pray for them. Now, this becomes important because he goes on to say that God gives Christians a high calling. And the calling is to see him glorified in us at his coming. I mean, he wants to see us as we are. 
I mean, there's a passage of scripture that says that it does not yet appear what we shall be like. But one thing we do know that when he comes again, we shall be like him for he shall see us as we are. Okay. Now, Paul rightly prays that the Thessalonians be counted worthy of his calling. And he shows ways to fulfill that calling. Because remember now, being a part of the church is more than just accepting Christ as your personal Savior and being saved. Okay, you got that under your belt. Okay, now you're part of it. You're a member of a congregation. Okay, now, but you still, uh, if you work of a work age, you're still working. You still have a family. You still go shopping at the grocery store. You still take people to uh, different places. You still interact with people in different places and different things and different situations and circumstances. And so the question or the challenge becomes, how do we live a, a life worthy of our call to be Christians? What is it that makes us who we are? So let's take a look at it. a few things and then I'm going to let you go. We live worthy of our call to be Christians when, first of all, when we fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness, living lives touched by his goodness and displaying his goodness. Or in other words, how we live our lives among each other. Okay? That has a lot to do with brothers and sisters, how we live worthy of our call to be Christians. But there's more. The second part is this. We live worthy of his call when we fulfill the work of faith with power. Believing on Jesus and seeing his work done all around us by faith. Or in other words, the things that we do and the things that we support with our home missions and with our foreign missions. What do we do to help those that are around us? What do we do to help those that are not around us? I mean, you may not necessarily be able to get on a boat or get on a ship or get on a plane and go to somewhere and help some people. But what are you able to do with those people in your neighborhood or those people in your surrounding area? Or what is the church able to do with the people that are in their community? Okay, that becomes important. That's how we live worthy of his call, the call of God. And that's when we fulfill the work of faith with power, believing on Jesus and seeing his work done all around us by faith. Okay, but then there's something else. And the third thing is this. We live worthy of his call when the name of our Lord Jesus Christ is glorified in us. Listen, we understand that this means more than the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as a word, but it also means or is a representation of his character. Or in other words, when our lives become an example or a type of who we serve, who are you looking for? Who are you looking toward? You know, what are you looking toward? Okay, when your lives become an example or a type of who you serve, that becomes exciting. That becomes important. And that enables us to live worthy of our call to be Christians. But then there's this next thing. And this is the last one, and then I'm going to turn you loose. We live worthy of his call when we are glorified in him, when he alone is our source of glory and exhortation, and we are in Jesus is, and that's more important than who we are in anything else. Listen, when our praise, when our worship, when our prayers are not dependent, are not expectant, are not inhibited by anyone else, it is then we are living worthy of his call, okay? Because we're glorified in him, and he's our source of glory and exhortation. We're not letting nobody inhibit our praise. We're letting nobody inhibit our worship. We're letting nobody inhibit our prayers. Our prayers are not dependent on whether somebody else is praying. Our worship is not dependent upon whether somebody else is worshiping. Okay? Uh, it becomes important for us to understand that. And then we're not expecting somebody uh, to be with us to the point where we won't do it until they get there. Okay? It becomes important for us to understand these things. So now, that ends chapter 2. Uh, of Second Thessalonians, uh, chapter one, rather. I'm sorry. And so now, as we prepare to go into chapter two of Second Thessalonians, we will look and discuss our new topic. And our new topic is going to be the difference between tough times and the great tribulation. Okay? Because sometimes people look at these tough times and they think we're in the time of tribulation. I'm here to tell you, 
That's not the case, but we're going to deal with it. But that's okay. We won't be the first ones that felt that way because there were other people that felt that way too. And so when we think about these things, of course, they give us the faith to anticipate as well as living a faithful life while anticipating the return of Christ. But we want to make sure we prepare ourselves to deal with the difference between tough times and the great tribulation. Amen. Okay, so that's it. That's all. We hope we've been helpful to you on the day. Uh, we want you to continue to be prayerful for us uh, as we look forward to uh, worship on this coming Sunday at 11 o'clock. Uh, we're thankful for all that God has done for us. And we want you to put down uh, in the text box those names you'd like us to remember in our prayers um, as we prepare ourselves to go down from this place. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for allowing us this opportunity to see another day which we've never seen before, the health and strength that you've given us. We ask that you be with all of those names that we've had opportunity to offer up. We ask you to continue to be with us in every way. Dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence, your love, and your protection. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. 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 All right. Well, God bless you. We thank you for sharing with us. Thank you all for sharing with us today. And uh, Sister Jones, we're grateful for our camera person. Uh, Sister Jones sharing with us on today. Say hello, Sister Jones. Hello, everybody. And so until next time, take care and God bless.